Good day everybody, RC Grabbag here, welcome back to the channel. So in my last video I completed construction of a 12 foot long curved 2 track wooden trestle. And in this video I'm going to be installing the 2 track mainline, as well as all of its turnouts and crossovers. I'm going to wire it, I'm going to set up the DCC control system, which will also provide the foundation for block detection and signaling. So with that intro out of the way, let's get started. So if you saw my earlier video where I'm putting down the staging tracks, I'm using the same technique to put down the main lines here. And that simply involves gluing down the cork roadbed to the sub roadbed using a general purpose construction adhesive called Loctite Power Grab, and I'll put a link to that down in the description below. And then I use that same adhesive to glue the track down to the cork roadbed. Now I'm doing a section of straight track here, so in addition to drawing some guidelines on the sub roadbed to guide the cork roadbed installation, I'm also using a laser level here to project a straight line across the cork roadbed so I can align the track properly. Now all my turnouts and crossovers on this layout are hand built. I'm using the fast track system of turnout fixtures and laser cut ties. And I'll put a link to their website in the description below and I'll go into a little more detail about their system later on. So when it comes to track lane, the technique I use is actually pretty simple. So here I have a piece of cork roadbed and I have my Loctite Power Grab construction adhesive. And I've cut the applicator tip at an angle here to facilitate the even spreading of the adhesive. And you can see I've got a nice well-formed bead of adhesive here. And then I'll go over it with a putty knife to spread it out and thin it out into an even coat. And once you have the adhesive evenly applied, you can turn the cork roadbed over and fasten it down to your sub roadbed. And here I'm just following a guideline I had drawn on the sub roadbed earlier to line everything up. And then I just repeat the process for the other half of the cork roadbed. Now once the cork roadbed is down, we can immediately put down the adhesive on top to glue down the track itself. And I'm going to go with the lighter coat of adhesive here just in case I need to make an adjustment to the track and I have to pop it off. Having less adhesive is going to make that easier. Unfortunately, the cork roadbed is not so easy to lift up. You can get a putty knife underneath, but when you take the cork roadbed up, it's going to leave a fair amount of it behind because the cork roadbed is just going to tear. But if you take a heat gun or a blow dryer and you set it on high and you point it at the leftover cork roadbed and adhesive that's on the sub roadbed, it will become pliable and you can scrape it up very cleanly with a putty knife, but it will require some effort. So here the adhesive is dried and both the track and the cork roadbed are firmly fixed in place. So back to the track lane, here I am putting track across a stone arch bridge. Now I have some plans for the tracks going across here that are going to involve some crossovers and turnouts. So I'm actually temporarily putting the track down here with some double sided tape. And it's a product from 3M that works very well for this kind of purpose. So I have this bridge and several other bridges that aren't even built yet that I'm going to need to put temporary track in place until I can get them actually completed. And here I move to another area and I'm putting the track down and it goes fairly quickly until you get to a turnout or a crossover then things kind of slow down. You have to drill your holes for the turnout machines if you're using those. And then when you put the adhesive down you have to be careful not to get it into any moving parts of the turnouts. And I'm also dropping a lot of feeder wires down to properly supply power to the turnout or crossover. Like the frogs for instance and other little sections of rail. One other tip here is I'm using standard bulletin board style push pins to keep things like this crossover here firmly pressed down against the cork roadbed while the adhesive dries. And I just tap them in with a scrap piece of wood. Now as I mentioned before I'm using the fast track system for building my turnouts and crossovers. And here are some of the fixtures and things that I've built using their system. On the left is a standard gauge number 8 turnout along with one of the turnouts I built. In the center is a number 10 double crossover with half of one built in the upper right there. And then finally on the right is a number 6 dual gauge turnout with one of the dual gauge turnouts that I built using it. Now when it comes to operating the turnouts I'll be using the servo actuated switch machines from an outfit called Tan Valley Depot. And I'll put a link to their website in the video description below. Here's a couple mounted in place and they come with a micro switch attached so they properly power the frog depending on which way the points are thrown. So back to the track lane and here I am working on the section that's approaching this brass lift bridge. And this is another situation where I'm going to be using temporary track in place of this bridge because unfortunately this bridge came to me in need of a lot of work. A lot of the solder joints had broken free so they have to be redone before I can use it. So for now I'm going to bypass this bridge with a temporary span. And here I'm putting that temporary span into place now. And in the meantime, I'll be working on repairing those solder joints. Now 
Now, one of the other things I wanted to talk about in terms of track lane is super elevation on the curves. Now, super elevation is the process of raising the outside rail of a curved section of the track, and it's done on the prototype to enhance the operation of the equipment. Now, I'll show you how I accomplish this effect on my own layout. So here are the materials I use to super elevate my track. On the left here is some medium cyan acrylate glue, some 100 grit sandpaper, and I'm going to use that to scuff up some surfaces so the glue adheres better, some styrene strips from Evergreen, and I'll put a link to where you can get these in the video description below. And the thickness of these strips that you'll want depends on how much you want to super elevate your curve, so do a little research first. I'm using 5 one hundredths of an inch thick strips here, so that gives me about four and a half inches of super elevation in scale terms. Now I start by sanding the underside of the track on the side of the rail that's going to be elevated. And I'm just scuffing up the underside of the ties here so that the glue adheres better. Now once I've got the track scuffed up, I'll take one of these strips of styrene and I'll do the same thing. I'll take the sandpaper and I'll just run it along on one side just to scuff up the surface a little bit. Now once I have the track and styrene surfaces prepared, I'll run a thin bead of the CA glue along the underside of the track on the side to be elevated. The flux track is about a foot longer than the styrene strip, so I'll use the strip as a guide for the length of the bead of glue that I'll need. Now with the glue in place, I'll take my strip of styrene, and with the scuff side down, I'll press it into the glue, and I'll just use the track's rail support as a guide. Once the glue sets, you can see that the original flexibility of the track is hardly affected at all, even with the strip glued in place. So here is the track in place, and you can see the white styrene shim material poking out underneath. So with all the mainline track in place at this point, it's time to talk about wiring. Now when it comes to wiring, the good thing is there's a ton of information out there on wiring model railroads. So if you don't know much about it, I suggest doing some research. There's plenty of info on the web, in books, etc. So I'll show you what I did on my layout, but you can make up your own mind about the materials and techniques that you'll use on your own layout. Now I use flex track on my mainline, and each section is three feet long. And each section has a set of feeder wires soldered to it. And then the feeder wires tap into heavier gauge bus wires that go around the entire layout following the main line. So for the track feeders, I use 22 AWG solid core copper wire. Now you can use either solid or stranded depending on what you prefer. I use solid wire because I find it easier to bend into the shapes that I need for soldering to the track, but I've seen both used successfully. For the bus wires, I use heavier 12 AWG stranded copper wire. Now, for tapping into the main bus wires, I use these number 562 Scotch Lock suitcase connectors, and I'll put a link below where to get these. They are a solderless connector, and they have a metal blade inside that cuts into the bus wire's insulation to make an electrical contact with the wire. Next up, I use another solderless wire connector called a Wago, and the nice thing about these is not only are they solderless, but they can also be used to connect wires of different gauges together. The ones I have here can join wire in the ranges of 12 to 24 AWG, so perfect for my needs. And of course, I'll include a link below. Lastly, I came upon these wire clips slash organizers, and these things are great because they work kind of like zip ties, but you can easily undo them so they are totally reusable. They come with double-sided tape attached to the back, and they also have a tapered hole for mounting with a screw. To use it, you basically just slide the pieces together around your wires, and the flexible part locks into place. Then if you need to undo it with a little bit of wrangling here, you just slide the flexible piece back through the other way, and it just pops right out. Okay, so to recap, we have our wire. We have our Scotch Lock connectors. We have our Wago connectors, and our wire organizers slash clips. Now, a couple of words on the way I run my bus wires. All of my bus wires are above the benchwork because all of my track, even at its lowest levels, is above the benchwork on risers. So I'm not drilling holes through the benchwork to run my wires through. You can drill holes if you prefer, I just chose not to. 
So as I'm running my bus wires through, I'm using these wire clips here. And again, the nice thing about them is they have this double-sided tape on the back, which I didn't really use, but I'm able to punch the screw through it and it holds it in place while I set the thing up for mounting. So mounting is just a simple matter of driving the screw into your bench work. And once the clip is firmly in place, you just take the flexible piece, wrap it around your wires, and lock it into place. Once the bus wires are in place, I'm going to tap into them for the power needed to supply the track. And I'm going to do this with some short pieces of the 12 AWG wire. I use lengths of about 8 inches. The length is not super critical, just something easy to work with. And I remove about a half an inch or more of insulation off the ends, and then I tin the ends with some solder. Now I'm going to tap into the bus wires using the heavier gauge tap wires that I just made along with some of these scotch lock connectors. So here I'm aligning the scotch lock connector to where I need to make the tap, which is close to some of the 22 AWG track feeder wires to which this tap will supply power. And then finally I'll squeeze the blade of the scotch lock connector with some angle nose pliers and this blade will cut into both of the bus wire and the tap wire to create an electrical connection between the two. So the last step is to join the 12 AWG tap to the 22 AWG feeder. And for this I'm going to use the Wago connector, which if you recall can join wires of two different gauges together. And you know I went solderless with these connectors, not so much for the bus taps, but these Wago connectors can make troubleshooting a lot easier. If you're trying to track down a short or something, it's easy to connect and then disconnect these Wagos as needed to help you track down an anomaly. So at this point our bus wires and our feeders are in place, so it's time to start talking about the DCC control system. So I went with the Digitrax DCC control system. It's what we had at our club and it's what I'm used to. And at the heart of the system is this DCS240 command station. And this model is nice because it now has a USB interface built in. So if I want to connect it to a computer running something like JMRI, I can do that without needing a separate USB module. And the second piece to my DCC system is this Digitrax DB220 booster, and it's essentially two boosters in one, and I'll be using several of these around the layout to handle power distribution. Next up, I'll be using several of these Digitrax BXP88 modules, and these modules will handle both block detection as well as circuit breaker protection. And these modules have circuitry built in to perform occupancy detection by sensing an increase in current draw from the track, so you don't need to wire separate detectors. And up next I'll be using several of these Digitrax SE8C signal decoders. And these in conjunction with the BXP88s will give me the block detection and signaling. They can also drive turnouts if you're using Tortoise turnout machines. And last up is the power supply. This power supply pictured here is from a company called Meanwell. And if you're not familiar with Meanwell, they make just about any power supply you might need for your modern railroad in all sorts of combinations of amperage and voltage. This is a Meanwell LRS200-15 power supply. It's a 14 amp power supply and it's rated at 15 volts DC, but the voltage is adjustable by a few points in either direction. And it can handle AC input of either 120 or 220 volts with a selectable switch. It's a perfect match for the DB220 booster. And as always, I'll provide a link in the description below where you can get these. So up next, the Digitrax components are gonna to wanna to talk to each other and other devices via Loconet. And in order to do that, you're going to need to make some Loconet cables. For that, you're going to need this crimping tool, some six conductor flat telephone wire, and make sure it's flat to make it easy on yourself. And you're going to need some RJ12 telephone connectors. So the crimper has a number of tools built in. One of them is a wire stripper. So you want to start by removing a bit of the insulation of the six wire conductor. And the crimper is designed to remove the outer jacket of insulation only. Now with the RJ12's release tab pointed up, align the white wire in the phone cable to the right side of the plug and press in firmly. Then using your crimpers, squeeze down on the RJ12 plug and this will drive the connector blades into the wires and securely fasten your wire in place. Repeat these steps on the other end of the cable so that you now have an RJ12 at either end and your Loconet cable is done. So to recap, we have the power supply, the DB220 booster, the SE8C signal decoder, the BXP88 modules, and some assorted fasteners. And I'm going to be grouping these components together in what I call a power and control node. The idea being that I will have several of these nodes around the layout. 
and they'll be handling the power distribution, block detection, and circuit breaker protection. So let's see how these are all going to go together. So I have a piece of plywood here, roughly 14 by 20 inches, and I'm simply mounting the components to the board. The Meanwhile power supply uses mounting brackets specially made for it, so I'll provide a link for those. Also, the SE8C decoder needs to be raised off the surface a little bit, so I made some standoffs with some styrene tubing. And finally, not mentioned before, I have some terminal strips to the right edge there of the plywood, and I'm going to be using those to handle all the incoming and outgoing wire connections. And all the wiring is done according to the instructions provided with each of the devices. So here you see the completed boards in place and operating. And as of this video, I have three of them around the layout, managing approximately 32 electrically isolated blocks and control points along the main line. And I have a few more planned for areas off of the main line. And here you see I also mounted them on hinges so I can fold them up out of the way under the benchwork, as well as give them a little bit of dust protection. So with the mainline wiring done and the DCC equipment in place, let's run some trains. Now this was not a prototypical operation session, so don't look for chronological or road name accuracy here. The intention was to run a variety of equipment to test the track work and wiring for reliability. So you're going to see an eclectic mix of equipment. So that's it for the train portion of our video. If you like what you saw, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified of future videos. And now we reach that segment of the video where I introduced some unrelated topic. And at this time last year, pre-COVID, 
my wife and I took a special holiday trip to a location that many of you here in the United States will probably find familiar, and maybe some of our friends abroad as well. So enjoy this little injection of holiday cheer, and I'll see you next time. Oh, well, there's one too many.